good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's BIC session on uh, Through Chinese Lens. You know, normally when I start my intros, I tend to be pretty irreverent. But with two eminent personalities, I was, I said, today I'll skip irreverence. But, but no, no, I, but I can't still resist it, Ram. So welcome to the Ram or Shams show. <laughs> So today's session uh, is around uh, Mr. Shamsaran's uh, book, uh, How China Sees India and the World, and uh, Ram will be in conversation with him. Uh, Mr. Shamsaran, as most of you would know, was former foreign secretary, uh, was former chairman of the National uh, Security uh, NSA, and also he is also the president of the India International Center, which has actually been an inspiration to set up BIC in the first place. Uh, most wel uh, welcome, uh, Sham, to BIC. And uh, Ram is a uh, regular, I mean, uh, historian, author, multiple books. Currently, I mean, he's taught at Yale, Stanford, all kinds of places. He's currently the uh, uh, at Kriya University. He is the distinguished uh, professor. Is, I think the rank is distinguished professor at Kriya University. Thanks, Ram, for doing this today. And with these few words, I would request both of them to come on stage and help us understand China. There is no better expert than Mr. Sham Saran. Thank you for doing this. Thank you all for coming here. And thank you, Ravi, uh, for everything that you and your team do at the BIC. Uh, it's a great privilege to be in conversation with Sham Saran about his new book. Uh, he's a rare scholar diplomat a deep thinker, as well as a hugely experienced practitioner. And it's a very unusual combination uh, in any country, particularly in ours. And I think probably in the whole history, if I may say so, talking about being irreverent, uh, in the whole history of the Indian Foreign Service, uh, outstanding diplomats have also been fine and reflective scholars, probably can be counted on the fingers of one hand. And Sham is one of them. His uh, new book is a wide-ranging history of China and the world, truly sweeping and multidimensional in scope. It starts with the ancient period and comes right down uh, to where China finds itself today. And it's about in China's relationship with itself, with India and the world, not necessarily in that order, but uh, as much as China's relationship with itself over the centuries, as how it sees its great uh, Asian neighbor and, of course, the wider world. So it's, it's really a very multidimensional book. It covers culture, politics, language, religion, warfare, trade, crafts, philosophy, economics, and much, much more. And it's also richly readable. You know, those of you who've read China, uh, Sham's first book or his columns in... Uh, places such as the Business Standard and, and, and the Tribune would know that he, you know, it, whatever he says sparkles with insight, but is also extremely readable. You know, there's no jargon or obfuscation in, in what he writes or how he thinks. And this particular book draws on uh, his own personal experiences of dealing with China. He was, had two stints there as a diplomat. Later, of course, he dealt um, uh, at a higher level with the Chinese government when he was foreign secretary of the government of India between 2004 2006. Still later, he was chairman of the National Security Advisory Board. He was our negotiator on climate change. But apart from this uh, practical experience of dealing with China, of course, the book drives over three, four decades of dealing with China. The book also draws on years and years of reflection, reading, and study. Now, Ambassador Saran's book is particularly valuable, I think. Because educated Indians, book reading Indians, know so little about our giant neighbor. You know, uh, we, uh, there have been some attempts in the past after the China War of 62, for example, to set up China studies departments, to promote scholarship on China. But it's fair to say that outside of small pockets in Delhi associated with the Institute of China Studies and their journal, it's not been very widespread, even in the academy. So, you know, outside of the maybe CSDS and JNU and the odd professor in Delhi University, you certainly won't find uh, scholars of China elsewhere. And 
uh, let alone the wider you know universe of the indian reading public middle class indians know far far more about america england even italy france spain thailand phuket they may know more about phuket than they than they know about china and i think that's why this book deserves such a wide readership because of what china means to india and to the world and which is what shyam's book is about now this is as is the custom uh, uh, at least for me where when i'm speaking to someone about their book a completely spontaneous free willing unstructured conversation shyam has no idea about what i'm going to ask him uh and i think perhaps it will work better that way so let me begin sham with one of your most intriguing remarks about china and india you know your book is a, it's how china sees india and the world and i think though you don't say it is also how china sees itself yeah. you know very much that's part of the book but one of the most i mean the many the book is peppered with arresting insights uh, perceptive remarks uh, judgments about history politics economics and one of the most intriguing sentences i found in uh, your book is this and i'm going to read out to you i quote this is sham writing in his book i consider chinese studies i beg your beg your pardon i consider chinese culture i consider chinese culture as predominantly visual so he, sham says chinese culture is predominantly visual a legacy of the ancient ideogram while india's is a predominantly oral culture where the spoken word the sacred mantra were to become its defining characteristics now i'd like you to expand on this because we can talk talk about politics and economics later but this is a fascinating cultural comparison where you say that in china it's defined uh, by you know the visual and in india by the oral so tell us what you mean mean, mean by this and how you arrived at this very arresting comparison uh thank you very much uh thank you very much uh ram and i would like to uh thank ravi and uh, bic for inviting me uh to have this conversation with one of the most eminent residents of this uh, city uh and a great historian so it's always uh, i think intimidating uh for somebody who's not a historian to have to talk to a historian uh so i hope you will be kind <laughs> uh with respect to the the um, uh, aspect that i have covered in the book uh as you would have seen i have said that one of the very fundamental attributes of chinese culture uh is based on in fact uh the ideogram uh why because something like uh maybe uh 3000 years ago um uh, actually writing started in china very uh pictorial to begin with so when you saw the character you knew what it was representing it is only over a period of time that it got more stylized and conceptual in nature but chinese culture is very much linked to that evolution of its script from what is were mainly pictures to what we have now as very complex symbols and over this period of time you will also find that these ideograms also became part and parcel of chinese aesthetics so many of you would have seen for example a chinese vase with beautiful you know uh, images on them but you also have vases with just chinese characters uh one of the most uh, uh, perhaps uh, um uh, the uh, art forms which is which is uh, really considered to be really at the at the top uh level in terms of chinese aesthetics is calligraphy you know so chinese calligraphy is a very important part of its art um uh, so chinese chinese uh culture has evolved co-evolved in a sense uh with the evol- evolution of the uh, chinese uh, script and everything therefore is linked to what an image represents what it says so that is why unlike perhaps in india where painting over a large long period of time until recently was artisanal yeah. it was not that artist was a great uh, sort of painter but he was an artisan 
you know. Uh, in China, painting was again one of the highest forms of art. You know, and uh, and uh, this is why I said that if you look at the evolution of Chinese culture, you will find that painting, calligraphy, you know, writing, these are in fact the very fundamental attributes of Chinese culture. Now in India, spoken language came first. So that's why I've said that, you know, uh, you have the ancient scriptures which are first heard, Shrutis. And then they are remembered, so they are smriti, because they were passed on from generation to generation, not written, but in fact oral. So, um, yeah, and also say, for example, music itself. In India, the musical form, which is again sound, yeah. is very, very highly developed. In Chinese music, if you hear, it is very, sounds very stilted. You know, it, it's, it's not, not very pleasing to the ear. But Indian music is really quite incredible in, in terms of, you know, the range of sound that it covers. And by the way, it is not written. Yeah. You see, if you have a great musician, he doesn't need to read before he's playing. Everything is in his mind. So this is why I said that, you know, Chinese culture is a visual culture. And Indian culture is essentially an oral culture, you know. Uh, of course, these are not, <laughs> you know, uh, sort of very, very, very uh, rigid divisions. Yeah. But if you're looking at what are some of the essential characteristics of the two cultures, I think these two uh, aspects are very important. Uh, you know, we could, I could <coughs> expand on that, I won't, you know, talk about what it uh, may, may say about the Chinese sense of history and our sense of history. But I'll move on from this large cultural comparison you make uh, to, um, you know, I'll move not in any linear order from subject Please. to subject. I mean, your book opens up so many areas of inquiry that I've just, you know, jotted around half a dozen, which particularly struck me. The next uh, theme I want to explore with you is to do with the relationship between China, China, Chinese culture, Chinese civilization, the Chinese polity, and the sea. You know, um, uh, and of course, there's some interesting comparisons to make with India. I mean, in, in, in South India, historically, we've had a very old and long connection with the sea. And perhaps not so much in North India, Punjab, UP, and so on. And obviously, that's maybe part of um, uh, the different ways in different parts of India have evolved. But the relation with Chinese culture and the sea, you, know, you have a fascinating chapter uh, on China as a maritime power in the first half of the second millennium. You know, uh, uh, you talk about from roughly the 10th century to the 14th century before they came under the rule of the Mongols. Uh, and then after that, they began to shut themselves off from the outside world and focus on their own on kind of territorial questions. And again, there may be a comparison with India with the expansion of the Cholas and of course, the Mughals coming in and are losing our connection with other parts of Asia. But in this chapter, which is much of it was new to me, I mean, I have not really, I'm not, I mean, I know a little bit about 19th and 20th century Chinese history, but not very much about the older period. What, what is striking in this chapter is you demonstrate what a colossal maritime power China was, how expansive was its circuit of trade, uh, uh, you know, which en encompassed many ports in India, Southeast Asia, East Asia. You also point out that Chinese ships were among the world's largest and most sophisticated in this period. And then, of course, they retreated into themselves and so on. But given um, the very long view that the Chinese take of their culture and of, uh, may, may I put it, their global ambitions, my question to you is this. Is the recent surge in naval capability and the determined bid for ex maritime expansion by China, you know, asserting its naval footprint in many parts of South, Southeastern uh, and, and Eastern Asia, uh, is it seen by its leadership as a necessary and just renewal of this older history when they were the greatest maritime power in the world? Oh, very much so. Uh, as I have pointed out in the book, you know, Chinese history uh, has a very contemporary relevance for its leadership. So if, whatever may be the policy that they are following, even if it has no precedent in history, they will find a precedent in history yeah. because that is a legitimizing principle. 
for the communist party or for yes. chinese people as a whole for when uh, for the communist party but yes even for the people they accept it. why does the communist party use that because it knows that in terms of legitimizing it it resonates with the people of china that is why it is successful so for example what the, the the what you mentioned about the maritime power china was never a maritime power except for those 350 years yeah. you know uh, and there, the the reason why it became a maritime power is also interesting because uh, you know the earlier uh, contacts of china uh, with the rest of the world more uh, you know uh, the prosperous countries like persia even the mediterranean india they were all through the caravan routes through central asia yeah. so that was their link to generally better known also yeah. to historians to, to link road, yeah. uh, to yeah. rest, rest yeah. of the world yeah. you know much of chinese uh, history and culture was dominated by more its uh, western part not so much the eastern part now what happened was that around the time the song dynasty came in there were these invasions essentially from the steppes from the uh, periphery of china the land periphery of china always china was threatened by these very aggressive tribes on its frontiers the manchus the mongols the tibetans uh, they were regarded the threat there was no maritime threat actually to china so uh, when those uh, trade routes were interrupted because of these invasions it was almost necessarily that china started looking at other ways of carrying on its trade and it just so happened that that was also the period when pushed by these aggressive tribes china the han chinese started moving into southern china they were ethnically not the same so there was a acculturation process uh, a assimilation process which was over several hundred years but when the chinese started coming into the southern part of china that is when they also then began to develop their maritime commerce because they had no alternative yeah yeah, yeah. and so from the song dynasty onwards which is around the 10th century as you mentioned right up to the ming dynasty even the mongols continued that naval tradition and it is only in the ming dynasty where the famous you know voyages of chang he you know the chinese admiral uh, took place uh, it is after that for various reasons uh, the threat from the land frontiers became heightened uh, the fact that uh, you know there was a, a kind of a political intrigue in the chinese court because most of the uh, voyages were actually carried out by the by the eunuchs who were very powerful lobby within the within the uh, court in the palace uh, so when there was a reaction against them all the things which were associated with them including you know the maritime expeditions the ship building they not only stopped the voyages but they actually dismantled the ship building industry so um, what i have said in the book that supposing that maritime tradition has continued yeah yeah, yeah. because they were the yeah. most uh, advanced naval power at that time and i have quoted which was i found it very interesting that somebody like ibn batuta uh, uh, you know during tughlaq's time he is going on a mission to china sent by uh, by by uh, uh, mohammed bin tughlaq and he goes to the south to what is now quilon to actually catch uh, a ship to china and these were the most advanced ships that he saw ever he thought that they thought it, they were like you know whole palaces uh, they had living quarters they were the largest ships ever made uh, so and also um, navigation the the techniques of navigation all that was systematically destroyed Uh, by the literary, uh, the Chinese bureaucracy, uh, once they got rid of the eunuchs, and so if they had continued, what might have happened? <laughs> they could have <laughs> they been would, a rival to them. They would probably have been the most uh, dominant power in Asia because so, there was no, there were no competitors. So uh, the maritime conflict between China and the West might have started then in the 16. Well, the 16th. West may not have been able to Come. actually oh. penetrate oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this uh, yeah. this uh, region. And uh, what is also very interesting is, uh, as as I discovered while while uh, writing this book, that it is the South of India, the Malabar coast, the Coromandel coast, were actually staging points for the Chinese mm -hmm. Chinese armadas. 
But you also say that among the reasons they retreated inwards was that the bureaucracy thought it was too expensive and too much of a drain on the was sector. A, there was a greater threat which they perceived okay. uh, uh, from the land frontiers of China. From the same, after all, they were soon conquered by the Manchus. Who were the Manchus? Yeah. The Manchus were also the steppe right. tribes. Uh, so there was a sense that uh, the uh, court was neglecting the real threat that China was facing from these aggressive tribes. And, you know, this was more like a, like a, you know, a hobby for the, for the emperor. Uh, this was not really okay. necessary. I mean, where was the threat to China from the, from the uh, oceans? There wasn't any threat. So today, I mean, to come, to use this link to carry on to my next question. Today, uh, of course, uh, because of uh, China's growing economic power, its growing political ambitions, and the threat it perceives from America particularly, it sees maritime uh, consolidation as crucial to its national identity. Ab absolutely. And its, its absolutely. Yeah. So also that uh, Changa was forgotten. As I mentioned, references to Changa's voyages, etc., all those were destroyed. So people forgot about Changa, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. but it was during the time that the imperial assault against China began in that the 19, in the 19th then, century. then yeah. you know some of yeah. the ma 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 very uh, well-known intellectuals like Liang Qichao, yeah. uh, he rescued in a sense <laughs> Changa from history and said, you know, if this is this is the tradition which we should have continued, and it is important that we become a maritime uh, you know power again. So it is from that point onwards that this uh, history was highlighted and you know today uh, also the chinese communist party uh, harks back to that age and said you know china has always been a great maritime power so uh, beyond uh, this sense that china sees itself as a great maritime power uh, they see themselves um, as one of the world's great civilizations maybe even the greatest and hence destined to dominate the world. I mean, they have a very high sense of self-regard, collective sense of self-regard. Uh, I'll come to India later, but let's uh, uh, stick to China. Now, one of the many interesting quotes in your book is from the current head of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, as saying in September 2020, uh, which is kind of roughly six months after the pandemic broke out, uh, he says, our country was a world leader in the development of ancient civilization during the Neolithic, Bronze, and Iron Ages. And then he goes on to say, Chinese civilization is the only civilization in the world that has continued uninterrupted since ancient times. Now, uh, this, I mean, there's intriguing comparison with the elevated sense of self that this quote represents and the elevated sense of self that America has of its destiny, of its manifest destiny, is based perhaps on only 200 and not 2,000 years of history. But nonetheless, there's a staggering amount of national vanity. I mean, I've unfortunately only visited China a couple of times. And I'm, as I've said already, I'm by no means any kind of expert on Chinese history, but I've lived long periods in America and I've studied their history and politics much more closely. And they have this also, you know, I don't know what, apne ko bhot samajhte hai, apne ko bhot samajhte hai, as we might say in Hindi, right? Yeah. Exceptionalism. Yeah. And it, it is that exceptionalism. America is the last best hope of mankind. American democracy and American pluralism are the end point of human history. America is the only exceptional country in the world. You remember when Obama made a speech, I think, in Cairo, and he said other countries think they're exceptional too, and there was so much <laughs> blowback to him. Now, my question to you uh, uh, with regard to your book and with regard to our conversation is, uh, the rivalry between China and America today, which will shape the next few decades, is about who will dominate the world economically, militarily, politically, and technologically. So there are four dimensions to the, broadly four dimensions. There's a fifth I'll come to later. Economically, militarily, politically, technologically. But is it also a clash of national egos? Uh, well, it's a clash of national egos in the sense that China believes that it is entitled to 
deference by others because of Inclu its including america including the united states because uh, of its civilizational depth or so everything there, else i mean a lot of chinese will point to what you just mentioned that you know we have a history as he said of so many thousand years here is a pip squeak in a sense uh, you know who's uh, uh just just uh, recently last 200 years or so has become a great power it is it is a great power uh, but you know it simply does not have that substance uh that that china has uh it does not have that kind of claim to natural leadership uh that china has so that is why the chinese said that you know throughout history we have been number one it is only a, a short period of 150 years or so you know starting from maybe the maybe the opium wars yeah, yeah. Uh, when we were under assault by the by the imperial powers um that china you know fell into a semi colonial status so what china is doing right now is nothing more than simply going back to where it was and therefore the rest of the world should accept that that what is happening today is china reclaiming its natural position at the top of the international order so they would say the, i mean to put it in uh, language the chinese would not use yeah. they are saying what the americans are talking about their natural right to supremacy is recency bias yeah well <laughs> <laughs> they did hide for a few decades and they think they they don't know that ours was much preceded well, that will advent yeah, going but yeah, no i i think but but uh, but but charm i mean given how much more interconnected the world is has been over the last since the 19th century compared to what it may be like in uh, you know 10000 ad or 500 ad or uh, the birth of christ i mean american dominance has been much more palpable oh far more uh, and, and much more across, extensive uh, right? and also much more extensive much more evident uh, so in that sense i mean americans also have a case Well, so they, I mean, for thinking so highly of themselves, you know, power is his own persuasion, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you are powerful, you can you can build your own narrative. Uh, so what China is really doing is uh, is building its own narrative. Even the the claim to dominance uh, is not a historically uh, you know uh, correct claim because. you can say that china had a certain sinosphere including maybe korea maybe japan maybe yes. uh, vietnam but it did not go beyond that yeah so yeah. i have pointed out if you compare it with the imprint which chinese uh, indian culture left yeah. say on southeast asia yeah. it is far greater far deeper than what a uh, chinese okay. culture uh, has okay. so it was very limited yes china was a very prosperous country it was a very very prosperous economy but that was not based on its link or globalization of the chinese economy it was very much a insular uh, sort of economy today china's prosperity is a creature of globalization, globalization. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, which sometimes the chinese forget that it is it is really because of the opening out of the world to china yeah. and china accepting to you know go out in the world that it has become a prosperous country in fact you now have american supremacists even saying uh, that henry kissinger made a terrible and tragic mistake going to going to beijing in 1971 well, you, i mean at that because it actually at that brought china into point, the world and yeah, yeah that particular point of time uh, what he did was from the american perspective was a brilliant master stroke but they, but they, but they would say i mean what uh, people argue in america now was it was a very short term view and that opening out has led to but america you know, people, slipping in the world people forget huh. that the time when america and china came together in 1972 china continued for several years after that as a very closed economy yeah, yeah. Uh, as a very insular uh, country so there was no i think um, some kind of a master plan by the americans uh, that you know we are we are going to open up china in fact their fascination about china their fascination about somebody like mao was precisely because they were completely different from what america had ever been used to i mean the kind of you know almost obsequiousness that you see in kissinger yeah, yeah. when talking to mao or talking to chow in lai is is 
not that you are here is a developing country who america is now going to come and help yeah but yeah. Uh, this is a superior civilization then yeah. in a sense you are paying homage <laughs> to <laughs> the sage emperor so i think yeah. uh, that was not perhaps the uh, impulse that is not the motivation originally yeah, yeah. Uh, from the united nations it may have been later on the consequence of that opening up but that was not the uh, impulse in the beginning so uh, to uh, carry on with this great fight for global supremacy that has been unfolding for the last maybe decade and a half and now it determine how the world i mean it will certainly evolve and we don't know how it will mutate in the next few few decades my own view is that in this great fight between america and china uh that china's lack of soft power will be a crippling impediment to their global greater global influence and let me uh, try and expand on this if you look at the british in their period of great dominance obviously they had you know they were um, the leading power in a naval sense they territorially conquered large parts of asia including our country and that bolstered their economy but i think the importance of their soft power not just literature but sport which is in many ways uh, you know uh, the greatest victorian invention all modern sports except for baseball except for basketball i beg pardon uh, you know because baseball is a crude version of I, uh, t20 not just a crude version of cricket but a crude version of t20 uh, all the sports you know uh, you look at look at american dominance it's their music their jazz to some extent the literature above all their film if you look at when russia was a superpower you know how shrewdly and cleverly they used 19th century russian writers like tolstoy who would have of course been appalled by communism to bolster their case again their classical music their ballet and china has in comparison with britain america and russia uh uh i think an abysmal lack of cultural gifts to give the world i mean maybe chinese cuisine but it's not really identified with the chinese state uh, uh in any particular sense and uh, do you agree with my thesis that their manifest hard power not being complemented by any sort of appealing soft power will really be a problem uh, in their global ambitions one i think uh, if we are talking about uh, soft power i would not delink it from hard power so the reason why say british soft power was able to sort of spread or americanism in a sense uh you know it it, it, it to begin with you have hard power i agree i agree, I agree. Uh, so that opens up opportunities for you to spread your yeah. Yeah. Uh, culture as well uh i would say give china time uh because they are, it is still the early stages and you are really sort of struggling against a a uh, shall i say a discourse which is still very much dominated by the west but and if you took just one minute huh. if you took a poll amongst the developing countries in africa for example or or other developing countries you will find that china is actually doing very well in terms of spreading its soft power but you know the confucian institutes have generally failed uh i do not link uh, you know the spread of chinese soft power only to uh you know the confucian yeah, institutes yeah. but what are the perceptions which have developed in say uh, many of the uh, developing countries in comparison to say the west how do they look at china and china is certainly today enjoying a far more positive image than the west is so they would say uh the positive image would come from they are less hypocritical than yes. the americans yes uh they are like us a formerly colonized people they are not they are not white supremacists but they but don't but they are also chinese racist <laughs> i i i don't, I don't. <laughs> but but it would not be uh they have things of beauty and joy to give us like cricket like pg woodhouse like american jazz like american film like the bolshoi ballet i mean they really haven't got there yet no and maybe so never uh, will. That, that, well i i think the second part i will not agree with the first part yes that's why i said you have to give them time because they are still a very young power uh and 
uh, as you pointed out earlier that they have a very long view uh, so they, they 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 will bide their time uh, i don't think that uh, they underestimate the importance of soft power so that is why xi jinping again and again says that you know who dominates what he calls discourse i know narrative uh, will be the will be the leading power in the future uh You, you, I talked about what you say about China as a maritime power, but your book also has some very interesting discussions of how, of uh, on territorial questions, particularly how China deals with its periphery. And uh, there's a chapter on China's contested and complicated relationship with Tibet down the ages. Very interesting and illuminating chapter. And you know, obviously, it's also linked to current events with our wishing the Dalai Lama. Uh, uh happy birthday i wish we would go further and give him the bharat ratna actually uh which will offend the chinese much more but um you have a chapter on china's relationship with tibet but if i was to point to a a kind of minor omission in your otherwise wonderful book it's that which covers so many things and no book can cover everything so maybe it's 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 an unfair criticism i'm making of it but still i'd like to point out that you don't you have a lot to say about tibet which obviously is crucial and important in chinese history and uh, of great interest to indian readers but you don't pay much attention to the province of xinjiang where the chinese have in recent years where their role has been much more controversial you know you talk of the this talk i don't know how credible of concentration camps with more than a million people and so on um, so again this is a i think tibet china has effectively controlled It is my view. Okay, at least at, for the time being, might this is a question I'm posing to you? Might Xinjiang become to China what Kashmir is to India, a region controlled only by the use of ever more, ever more military force and state power? The reason why the reason why it may be easier for them to uh, control uh, Xinjiang and perhaps not so easy to control Tibet is that. there has been systematically over a long period of time a complete demographic change transformation of xinjiang so today the majority population in xinjiang is han population it's not uh, the uighur uh, population uh, so that itself is a very major uh, difference from tibet where attempts to try and change the demographic uh, profile of tibet has not been very successful precisely because of the fact that the you know climatic conditions the uh, geographical conditions are that much more difficult uh, so uh, in in terms of you know their sense of assurance that they can control uh, xinjiang uh, that is perhaps more than tibet. in fact tibet uh there is a nervousness about tibet which you may not necessarily see uh, uh outside but that is very much uh, there and dalai lama himself is a very much part of that because of the uh, fact that the chinese have not been able to really somehow reduce his profile uh within uh, tibet itself he is still you know considered like a god amongst the people of uh, tibet uh which is why they get very number there is nothing like that in 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 xinjiang and the reason why i have concentrated more on tibet is also because it is far more relevant in terms of the india china relationship yeah. to the uh in, in comparison xinjiang yes we do have like i mentioned the east east ladakh conflict for example does have something to do with uh, xinjiang as well uh, but it doesn't have the same kind of um, uh, you know relevance as uh, tibet has so people in india do not understand why tibet is such an important factor in india china relations and i think i have mentioned that i cannot see a uh, a kind of a settlement of the india china border issue without some understanding uh some compromise with regard to uh, tibet itself it is going to be a very important uh, component but when you say compromise from whose side their side or our side or both well, sides i mean what we came to finally um you know in some of the some of the uh, back channel talks that we were having with the chinese uh what became clear to us is that unless there is some 
reconciliation between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Chinese, yeah. uh, it is very difficult to see how this can be, you know, sort of taken off the table, as it were, in India-China uh, relations. Uh, many people have thought about China as a uh, Tibet as a card to be played yeah. against China. Yeah. There is no such Tibet yeah. card. Yeah. Uh, so, um, would such a reconciliation be good for India? Yes, it would be. Several attempts have been made to promote that reconciliation, but eventually it has not succeeded. I think it would be good for China too. Uh, uh, but I don't see it happening because, again, because of what you said, that the Chinese take a long view and the Dalai Lama is going to die well, and this potent symbol yes. of Tibetan autonomy yes. will disappear, I, will not be replaced. I, and, I yeah. must tell you that in some conversations I have had with the Chinese, uh, when they have made that point, after all, he will die and the problem will solve itself. And I have said, your problems will, in fact, begin after that. Because today... The militancy that you see, uh, which is latent, especially amongst young Tibetans, whether it, they are the Tibetans living on the Indian side or on the Tibetan side, uh, that is in a sense constrained by, uh, in fact, reverence for the his figure of, and, and his philosophy of yes. nonviolence and quite right. tolerance and yes. dialogue and so, all. That. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is a, a, the reconciliation of the people of China with the people of Tibet. Yeah. He would be the best medium uh, for that. I think that is what they do not understand. Yeah, I wish they would because I think he might be happy to even to go back symbolically and say that. He's been ready yeah, for some yeah, time now yeah, because yeah, he feels yeah. that he's now, you know, nearing the end of his life. If somehow uh, he could perhaps, uh, you know, uh, promote that kind of a reconciliation, it would be good for the, yeah. you know, Tibetan people. I want to, uh, let me see how much time we have. I want to come to now to China and India. Uh, uh, I'll be, it probably go on 15, 20 minutes. So, you know, um, um, you talk in several places of how the Chinese reinterpret and rewrite the history. And in our conversation already, we referred to that. And reinterpreted in a way that suits their modern statecraft and their contemporary political needs. Um, but the, there are parallels here between modern India and modern China. You know, you talk about what the Chinese call their century of humiliation at the hands of European and also Japanese colonialists, let us, let us not forget. And how through the second, from 1949 till today, which is almost 80, uh, 80 odd years, uh, the Chinese have sought to emerge from this and a uh, sense of humiliation and, you know, overcome it. Uh, I couldn't help thinking uh, that the ideology of the ruling party in India today, is, of course, the ruling parties, they came to power only in 2014. And it's a rather different animal from the NDA one. But still, in the last eight years, if you look at the chatter among the ideologues of the ruling party, uh, public as well as on social media by their most fervent supporters and so on, uh, it appears that their statecraft and their politics, at least the, the hardline wing of the BJP, would argue that um, their statecraft and their politics should be animated by, the dis by uh, a program of redeeming the country, not just from a century, but from what they would say is a millennia of humiliation. All right. Now, I was reading your book, it struck me. You know, the Chinese talk a lot about, yeah. and a lot of uh, what they have done since 1949. In fact, even from the, I would say from, you know, the 1911 onwards has been animated by this, right? Uh, but just a century. Now, now we are talking about Indians uh, avenging a millennia of humiliation. So your thoughts on this and where this might take us? Well, uh, the difference is that uh, if you take uh, the... the uh, sort of reform and revolutionary period uh, in China, which is around the uh, end of the 19th century, beginning of, say, the 20th uh, century. What is very interesting is that it began uh, as a revolt against the Manchus, not so much Western imperialism, you know. Uh, so that was the impulse that, you know, we are fighting against what uh, Sun Yat-sen said, the Turks, you know, I mean, Manchus were <laughs> nothing to do with the Turks, but yeah, yeah. that is how he described them, that they are cruel, oppressive, and we need to overthrow them. So that was the earlier impulse. What you see today, and the 
you know, little bit that you read out of uh, Xi Jinping's, uh, you know, view of Chinese history. Uh, you know, the, the periods where China was under alien rule, and this was not the first time. So I pointed out for 50% of Chinese history, uh, large parts of China and sometimes the whole of China was under alien rule. But what have the Chinese done today? Unlike what we are doing in India, what the Chinese have done today is that all of them have been sanitized. So they are all part and parcel of the same flow of Chinese history. So they don't say, oh, we were under alien rule <laughs> under the Manchus or we were under alien rule of the Mongols. They are all Chinese. Yeah, yeah. See, So there is a, there is a, 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 a kind of a acceptance and in a sense, or even legitimization that this is also a part of history that we accept. Yeah. Now here... You are basically uh, saying that, uh, you know, your, your century of humiliation, several centuries of humiliation began, you know, many years ago. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, there is, there is a kind of a, both in both countries, uh, there is a certain contrived narrative about your history. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, so the Chinese have blanked out the fact that large periods of their history uh, they were fragmented, they were not united. Yeah. If you look at the hi historical pattern in India and China, they are not very different, is it? I mean, there were periods of fragmentation, there were periods of very high, very powerful centralized empires, there were periods when, you know, large parts of the country was under alien rule. There were periods where, no, they were, they were you know, Han Chinese who were ruling. Uh, so this, this is something which in both countries you find, that there is a certain idealized narrative about its own history. Uh, the Chinese have it and we have it uh, too. So what you are seeing uh, play out is really that kind of uh, idealization of history uh, that, is, that is being put forward. Uh, and it is true that it resonates with a large yeah. part of our country. But it seems to be listening to you. There's a kind of a reversal <laughs> here where uh, we first said, I mean, if you look at the nationalists, not just... Uh, people like Gandhi and Gokhale, but even Annie Besant, who is more, actually more Hindu than any of those so-called Hindus, she writes that the difference between uh, the British and, uh, you know, the Mughals and the Tughlaqs and the Delhi Sultanate and everyone else is that the British did not stay here. They took their wealth and left. Right. So they are, the others are actually part of us. And of course, you know, this kind of syncretic nationalism view uh, promoted by Nehru and Azaz was of that kind. And now we've reversed that by saying, actually, no, they were also foreigners. So, uh, and I think, so in a sense, whereas the Chinese have, in some ways, taken a more pragmatic position. Yes. That they've said, since the Manchu stayed here. Yes. Mrs. played here and, you know, they, they bred here and they remained here and they built their houses here and they learned our ideographs and learned how to write like us uh, and to eat like us. Yeah, they were making sense. Yeah. Uh, except for Xinjiang and Tibet. <laughs> oh, okay, except, all right. Okay. But uh, yeah. uh, to, uh, to just uh, take this point uh, forward, I think, uh, if you look at the flow of Indian history, yeah. it would be fair to say that it is the British who were, became the indigestible element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Others assimilated, yeah. in a sense, which, whichever way. Yeah. Uh, but they yeah. could not be yeah. assimilated. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Uh, so this is this is uh, something which is different uh, from from China in that sense that. Uh, the assimilation process, uh, except for Xinjiang and, and Tibet, which actually form a very large part <laughs> of China, uh, that uh, assimilation process uh, did uh, take place. But, you know, in China, the, uh, the difference which I see is that China uh, believes that homogenization is very critical to national security. So you need to make the Tibetans Chinese. You need to make the Uyghurs Chinese. And the problems you are facing is that they are ch not Chinese enough. I don't think that's really different from the view of homogenization well, today. I'm, I'm saying that the reality in India uh, is very different. We are, whether you like it or not, you are a very diverse country. You are a very plural society. You do have, whether you like it or not, large number of languages, large number of scripts, you have different subcultures, you have different traditions. Uh, that is a reality that you cannot abstract from. 
How do you try to put a monochromatic frame over what is this bewildering kind of uh, diversity? Uh, so this is why I believe that such a very narrow limiting vision of nationhood is not likely to succeed. Yeah. So let me end with two questions, two um, issues on China and India that emanate from your book. Uh, you know, uh, there's a chapter uh, which is called, it's about India as a teacher, your quote, negative by negative example. You know, the Chinese who know their history, where, do, where does India fit in here? They have a low opinion of Indians because of the, our role, uh, not, not our role, but our ancestors' role, as collaborators with the European colonists, colonialists in the opium trade, in the imperialist wars, you know, um, uh, as traders, sepoys, soldiers, you know, security guards and enforcers and so on. Uh, also, if you come to the 20th century, you know, uh, uh, Mao really had a contempt for Gandhi and Nehru, partly because of non-violence. And of course, as you mentioned in your book, Modernizing Chinese intellectuals uh, didn't much care for Tagore, who they saw as too much of an oriental sage who was impeding, uh, you know, the modernization process. And the Chinese who live in the present mock us for our incompetence and inefficiency. You know, I, on one of my two visits to China, I spent a day in the party school. This was early in Xi Jinping's first term, you know, when, when China was actually quite, de in terms of, uh, it was, there was a kind of a loosening of authoritarianism in the first decade and a half of the, of this century. That's, and I spent, I spent a week with a, a conference of Chinese intellectuals. The last day was in the party school in Beijing. And there was a scholar who, by the way, prided himself on his uh, passion for calligraphy, who had studied um, uh, at the Central European University inspired by George Soros and was actually a partisan of democracy. And he told me, he said, we Chinese would take your uh, 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 Indian passion for democracy more, more, more seriously if you built better flyovers and your roads in tap potholes. All right. We would then take the case to us. To, I would take the case to my fellow Chinese too. So this idea of India as a teacher by negative example, which is, which is uh, quite pervasive in, uh, in how the Chinese view us. So say something about that. So... Uh, there is, uh, it, in, in the sort of experience that I've had uh, both living in China as well as my encounters with Chinese, uh, what I have found is a very deep ambivalence about India. Because the fact that uh, there was a time before 1000 AD where India was seen as an alternate center of civilization and culture to which China differed. So India did not fit into the Chinese mandala of a highly centralized, you know, civilized uh, country, essentially surrounded by concentric circles of lesser civilized, lesser cultured people. Uh, so they were various shades of barbarianism, but they were essentially barbarians. India did not fit into that. Because it was seen as a alternate center of culture and civilization to which many Chinese went to learn at the feet of masters in Nalanda or in Vikramshila. Uh, you had uh, Buddhism which came uh, from India and then spread all over uh, China. Uh, so there was this sense that yes, we are a superior culture, but you know, a little far away. Thankfully, there is also a, a country which is uh, an alternate center of culture and civilization. Uh, perhaps even a country to be deferred to. That is why in, during that period... But deferred India, to because of Buddhist culture and scholarship. Buddhist, not just Buddhist culture, but it was a superior culture. There was a lot more knowledge uh, that China could imbibe. Uh, so it was called Sithian, which means Western Paradise. That is how India was described. So memories of that time still persist that, you know, there was this great uh, Asian uh, civilization. Uh, but then you have the modern period where it is, it, they, the, what the Chinese intellectuals start saying is, may have been a very rich culture and civilization at one time, but look at what India is today. It has become a slave nation. It has become dominated by the West. It has lost its culture. It has lost its sense of 
uh, itself and its identity. And this is not the future that China must have. So that is why I said, you know, India is a teacher by name. What should we not aspire to become? You know, so people like Kang Youwei, for example, essentially the writings was, look at this as an example not to follow. You know, that, India, that China should never, you know, become uh, like that. And also, um, there are other things which come into the way Chinese perceive India. So I have pointed out, for example, even after independence, uh, the Chinese were very, very bewildered by the fact uh, that independent India, having had this long struggle against British colonialism, how did you end up with the first head of state being actually, you know, a representative of that colonial power? Why did you continue with a civil service? Well, essentially, these are the fellows who served with the British Empire or the British Indian Army, for example. So, if you put yourself in their shoes and you're looking at India, you say, there is something, something odd about this. Here is a country which says it is an independent country, and yet you have this problem. The other very important aspect is that if you look at the Indian national movement, it would be fair to say that it was very much an English educated, English speaking elite of which Nehru was a very big example. Uh, they are the ones who actually led the independence movement. You know, it was not a vernacular movement in that sense, although it may have seeped through Gandhi into, into uh, that, uh, uh, the masses. Uh, but it was very much an English speaking elite. The, the uh, resurrection of Indian history, you know, uh, the knowledge about Ashoka or the knowledge about, uh, you know, Sanchi or the great culture that India was, in a sense, it is the many British who actually <laughs> brought that, uh, you know, to the to public uh, consciousness. In China, the important thing is that the nationalist discourse you know, the discourse of revolution was always carried out in Chinese. Chinese administration was never overthrown. It was not replaced by a colonial administration. It was always a Chinese administration. And that is a very important difference between, between the two. Uh, that at no point in China was the discourse carried out in a language other than uh, Chinese. And the spread of that revolutionary, you know, uh, sort of temper was through the Chinese script. Because even though people were, say, you know, speaking different dialects, they could always read what was what was written in in Chinese. Again, very different from uh, from India. So I think uh, in analyzing Chinese perceptions about India, uh, this these aspects perhaps we do not. I mean these may be self-evident, but we don't quite see it that way. Uh, so in trying to understand Chinese perceptions about India, the, knowing these attributes becomes very important. I mean, that's my, that's my, my view. So uh, uh, I just have, uh, I'll just ask Sharma last question. So those of you who have, uh, you know, want to ask him, could think of your question later on. When we finish, you could come up to the mic here. You know, uh, let me just end with, um, uh, uh, your hat as a practicing diplomat and not as a scholar and analyst, which we've talk, mostly focused on uh, for the rest of, uh, for the uh, earlier part of this conversation. Uh, you know, I want to talk about where might China-India relations go? And if you look at uh, the period after the 62 war, which is of course a great humiliation for us, not a major victory for them, but you know, they, they saw it as a trifling border conflict, which they, obviously they won quite easily. Um, but if you look at uh, how the ice was broken, something you meant, two, the two things you mentioned in your book, which are quite important. One is um, Rajiv's visit uh, to Beijing in 1988. And Rajiv Gandhi was not just prime minister, but he was Nehru's grandson. And he had a, at least, the optics, the public optics was, it was a civil and courteous exchange between Deng Xiaoping and, and Rajiv, where Deng is supposed to have said, I am the past, you are the future, or some such kind of, uh, you know, um, catchy line. And from the 90s, of course, India then starts liberalizing under Narsimha Rao and Manmohan Singh. And our exchanges with China, our trade and 
commodity exchange with China grow. And uh, meanwhile, our software uh, sector is developing. And in 2005, when you're foreign secretary, you talk in the book about Wen Jiabao's visit to uh, India. And uh, Manmohan, he's meeting with Manmohan Singh and their statement of economic cooperation. And as I recall, Sham, uh, I think Wen started his visit in Bangalore, not in Delhi. Yeah. He started a visit in Bangalore and he said something like, we will work together. Uh, and you, it are is, you, are, the you are the software and we are the hardware. And we, okay. Now, those were two uh, moments, uh, the Rajiv Deng thing in a more symbol, uh, purely in a symbolic sense, but the 2005 meeting in which, of course, you were uh, a crucial uh, participant between Wen and Manmohan Singh, where it was much more tangible and substantial. So economic, technical cooperation, that led to, of course, a massive uh, trade boom in which, uh, uh, including the Chinese, a Chinese com company promoting a cricket team and an IPL contest. And then it all came asunder in 2020 with the clash in, in Galwan. And the suspicion and the conflict of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s has now uh, once again come to overshadow China-India relations. So this purely pragmatic sense of economic, technical, cultural, possibly even political cooperation, what do you see as the future, short-term and medium-term future of China-India relations? Uh, I think we could draw lessons from that period uh, which you mentioned, which is roughly about 2003 to, to maybe 2007 or so. Uh, what I have pointed out is that even though India in comparison to China was a less powerful country, a smaller economy, the difference was that India at that time was growing at a rate faster than China. The Chinese economy had begin, begun its secular decline. Uh, India was seen as catching up with China. So India was being seen as the next China in a sense. Uh, there was also a appreciation of Ind the, the reach of India's power. Uh, so tsunami, for example, was a very, very important uh, you know, event where India was seen with its naval power to be able to reach uh, assistance to a very large number of uh, countries. That is, was, uh, that is the beginning of the Quad because it is the four navies of Japan, India, US and Australia who actually coordinated their moves together. I was foreign secretary. Every morning I used to have conversations with my three counterparts uh, to talk about how we could coordinate our assistance. So that left a very important impression on their minds. That, on the Chinese minds? Uh, well, uh, Chinese minds because they saw that it made a deep imprint <laughs> on the American mind. <laughs> so. Uh, both in terms of India's uh, rising uh, military profile as well as its economic profile, uh, there was a sense in China that, you know, India, uh, maybe we should ensure that India remains non-aligned in a sense. We were negotiating the Indo-US nuclear deal at that time. The Chinese knew that we were doing that. Uh, so the pressure on them was that we need to be seen as somewhat more amenable to Indian interests, more sensitive to Indian concerns, uh, so as that they don't go too much in the in the direction of the United States. And which is why 2005 visit was such a high point. And the message what uh, Wan Chiapa was giving to Prime Minister uh, uh, Manmohan Singh was that Look, we must have some points of consensus. You know, the Chinese are very good at this. What, what are the points of consensus we have? So it was one, India is not a threat to China. China is not a threat to India. India is a great opportunity for China. China is a great opportunity for India. You know, And there are many things that we can do together. What are these? That in terms of adjusting existing global regimes, say the World Bank, the IMF, uh, you know, what's what's uh, happening with respect to, for example, uh, the WTO. But, but always excluding the permanent membership of the UN Security Council. Yes. Uh, well, uh, they did come fairly close to uh, acknowledging that India has a has a rightful claim uh, to that, uh, but that we need to build consensus uh, around, around that. But essentially saying that there are several things in terms of the global situation where India and China have certain convergent interests and it would be good if we could work together on that and in order to work 
together. Things like the India-China border issue should be, you know, got out of the way. Uh, so that is at the that is the time when uh, the you know the special representatives had already been set up during uh, Atal Bihari Bajpayee's visit to uh, China, and there was uh, really a sense that uh, if we worked hard at it, we could actually get it out of the way very quickly. You compare that with 2010. The same Wan Chiaopao comes again to India. And when he's asked, what about the border issue? And he says, this is a legacy of history. It will take a long time to resolve. So you, you see how already the, the, the you know, perception of India as a major actor has changed. By what has happened? The global financial and economic crisis takes place in 2007, 2008. China sees as I have quoted that uh, uh, one of the Chinese minister tells, tells Hank Paulson that we thought you were our teachers, uh, but you have now proved to be, you know, not, not a good teacher. We are now going to be the teachers uh, because you have made such a mess of your, <laughs> of your economy. So the economic uh, diver di divergence between US and China starts shrinking. China recovers much more quickly from the global financial and economic crisis. India, which is growing at the rate of 8 to 9%, before that, the growth rate comes down to even less sometimes than what China's growth rate is. So the gap between the two start increasing. So you have these two things happening at the same time. The power gap between China and the US is diminishing, and the power gap between India and China is increasing. So their sense is, why do we need to be more sort of sensitive to Indian concerns? We are a powerful country and they need to understand that we are a powerful uh, country. So things at the border, which could be resolved very easily through, you know, uh, conversations between the two sides, uh, came to a point where, why should we, you know? Uh, they need a rap on the ruckles if if there is any any you know activity on the border. There is really no need for China to be sensitive to Indian Indian concerns. So my the lesson there therefore uh, to answer your question is that unless that you know sense of gap with India uh, begins to diminish again, uh, and I think. India is fully capable of doing that. Uh, unless that starts happening, we may not see much, you know, uh, sort of shift in Chinese uh, positions. So that has been for me a masterclass in how, in trying to understand how China sees India and the world. Thank you, Sham. Uh, and we have some time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the illuminating discussion. I'm Arjun. I'm a student at Peking University in Beijing. So my question was about how you think about China and, uh, and how they see Indian cultural diplomacy and the role of India's diaspora, particularly in Southeast Asia, right? When we talk about Buddhism, we talk about the Mahabharata, Ramayana, shadow puppetry in like Cambodia, Indonesia, Thailand, and more recently we have you know, members of the Indian diaspora in Malaysia, Singapore, a lot of former foreign ministers, the current foreign minister in Singapore are of Indian origin. How do you think they see all of this? How do I see all? How do you think they see all of this? Ah, well, uh, they are, they are, they, they certainly see that uh, in many respects, like uh, for example, software. You know, they see that India is a, a leader. Uh, they do see that, uh, particularly the Indian English speaking elite um, is very professional. Um, they are, you know, CEOs of uh, many multinational uh, companies in a manner that Chinese are not. So there is that uh, recognition, there is that acknowledgement. But if you're talking about the cultural aspect, uh, it is, it is uh, true that if you look around Southeast Asia, there is no doubt that there is a greater imprint of Indian culture than there is of Chinese culture. So if you go to Cambodia or you go to Indonesia particularly, if you go to, you will see that, uh, you know, you will see colors and echoes of India virtually everywhere you go. Uh, that's, a, that's a reality. It's not something that you have to sell. It is, it is there in a manner that the Chinese do not have. But in the Chinese case, what they, at least what I feel that they uh, that that they think is that as i mentioned 
uh, power is its own persuasion. That the first order of business is to become more powerful. Then other things will follow. Secondly, to be feared is perhaps preferable uh, than to be liked. So if it is a choice between presenting a more benign face in order to get what you want, uh, yes, you can try that. But ultimately, if it is, a it is a question of exercising coercive power against your adversaries, your partners, don't hesitate to use that. So that sense of power uh, is perhaps very different from what it is uh, with Indians. So you know, does that, it really matter then? Our imprint does matter as much, potentially? Well, if it is not backed by power, uh, it may not have the same shall I say, traction <laughs> as, uh, as otherwise. This is why I was saying that if you're looking at soft power of the West, uh, I would not delink it from hard power. You know, it's, it's not as if some countries are good at soft power, other countries are good at hard power. It is usually a combination of the two that really matters. At least that's my experience as a diplomat. Thank Come. you. Thank you. Uh, good, <clears throat> good, even good evening, sir. My name is Vinay Bhushan and I have in the past worked for the Policy Planning and Research Division of the MEA. Uh, so your, in your talk, you uh, spoke of China, you began with the Chinese philosophy and Chinese culture. Now, the Chinese are known to be an inscrutable people and their statecraft is highly choreographed. Uh, and there's a lot of enigma attached to analysis of Chinese uh, mindset and uh, statecraft. So given that the world is in a state of flux today, it is all, it's been so for quite some time. Now with the Russian mis misadventure in Ukraine, it's even more of a state of flux. Uh, is it difficult for India and the world to make sense of what China is going to do next, where China is headed, what China is making sense of all of this? And is its inscrutable statecraft coming in the way? Thank you. Inscrutability is an affectation. It is not reality. It's not as if, you know, uh, China, one cannot understand. You know, uh, Chinese would like you to feel that you cannot understand. Them. Uh, but much of what uh, Chinese uh, are doing in terms of their foreign policy, you know, you can easily analyze it. Um, and it is true, which is why the reason why I wrote this book is that in understanding China, understanding Chinese behavior, it is important to put it in that larger cultural and historical context. It makes it easier to understand uh, the language which they are using, because as I have pointed out, they constantly make references back to some historical event, some historical personage. Uh, in the debate that carries on within China itself. If you know that, if you know that backdrop, you can understand. So I do not buy the argument that there is some kind of, uh, you know, enigma, Chinese enigma that we cannot resolve or that uh, is a country that nobody can really, you know, uh, get, get to the bottom of. I, I don't think that is, uh, that is really uh, true. But the Chinese use it certainly as as an element of their their diplomacy uh, there is a certain kind of a theater involved uh, so when i was in beijing um, you know uh, ford had president ford had come to uh, china on a visit and uh, the americans were so nervous and panicky because they were not being told if and when mao is going to receive him so, you know, it was because it would be, the, the, the visit would be a disaster if Mao did not receive, uh, receive purpose. And he was on his way to the Great Wall on a sightseeing visit when word came that Chairman Mao will receive you. So literally the car kid had to turn around, you know, and come back to Beijing so that he could have his meeting. You think that this was not orchestrated? Of course it was orchestrated. Uh, so this kind of drama, you know, is very much part and parcel of how they, how they, uh, you know, carry out uh, diplomacy. If you understand it, then it doesn't make much difference to you. But if you don't understand it, it does. You know, uh, Sham, uh, 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 there's something I, sh I should have asked you, a contemporary question on China today. Uh, you know, um, obviously, you looked at deep historical, cultural political, economic, technological processes in your book. 
and those are fundamental in shaping history. Uh, but professional historians uh, generally don't give enough importance to individuals. Now, I am both a historian and a biographer, and I've been accused in the past of giving too much importance to individuals. But I think there's a balance, as Marx famously said, Individuals make their own, uh, make history in conditions that are given to them. But sometimes it is given to individuals to shape destiny. And in the history of post-1949 China, there are three individuals who have had that kind of extraordinary ability to shape history. Mao, Deng, and now Xi. And uh, uh, he certainly is inscrutable. Uh, so we don't know. I mean, will he allow this have a third term? What will happen? When, you know, I mean, he's certainly, let me put it this way. He's, uh, he's far more inscrutable than Modi or Trump. <laughs> and this is not because, this is not because India and America are democracies and they are not. It's, it, there is. <laughs> well, uh, all, uh, I, I think, uh, strong leaders uh, play their cards close to the chest. So I don't think this is a special Chinese uh, okay, quality, okay, okay. you know. Uh, now also many things that they do, uh, when you like, for example, when we now have access to a lot of Chinese archives, uh, we see that, you know, uh, the Cultural Revolution, for example, or the anti rightist campaign, how closely these were related to some very, very brutal Political Actually, factionalism uh, taking place. Including arguably the 62 war also. Yes, because, yeah. uh, you know, the 62 war happened in a sense because it got caught up in a very, yeah. very, very, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a kind of a factional uh, struggle between the moderates, as it were, and Mao. He was appealing to the uh, People's Liberation Army to really provide him with uh, support yeah. because he was in a minority. And the cultural revolution was used to get rid of virtually all his all his rivals, you know. Uh, so many things which on the surface look like dramatic historical events and they were dramatic historical events. But the reasons why the individual <laughs> actually did this uh, was perhaps a very much more pedestrian than we think. But, you know, okay, so, but... I said. But I agree with you, Ram, that, yeah. uh, you know, leaders do make a difference. And, for example, when I was involved in the negotiations on the nuclear deal with the United States, there is no doubt that certain crucial moments in those negotiations, when we came up against a, you know, a, a sort of odds which we thought we could never, ever manage to get uh, across, uh, it was actually uh, President Bush, his personal decision, which actually uh, enabled us to get over some of those problems. So sometimes when, you know, issues are sort of at that razor's edge, yeah. as it could go this way or that way, because of historical factors, they could go either way. On those certain moments, the decision which is taken by a leader can make all the difference. So I, at that sense, where China is today, I think... Um, their collective fate as a nation, as a civilization, at least in the short term, uh, does rather hinge precariously on what one individual does uh, or yes. does not do. Uh, well, also whether in terms of how he sees his interests, uh, political interests, how much will it gel with a number of other important players? Because, you know, it is not that he is able to exercise the power that he is able to by himself. He has persuaded a number of other very powerful elements in the party to be able to actually support what he's doing for maybe goodies that they would get in, in turn, but that support is required. In the Chinese system, uh, patronage is very important. You work through patronage networks. Leaders go up, they have to you know uh, take care of their patronage network. So uh, he has a patronage network. You know, when you talk about a Church Young faction supporting him, or you talk about a Fujian <laughs> faction supporting him, people who had worked together with him in these provinces, uh, these are important uh, in, in the Chinese context, they are important. Yeah, uh, good evening. We are enjoying the Sham Ram show, uh, the nice jugglement going on. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, two questions, maybe. Uh, 2050. 2050, 
You see, uh, China ever emerging as a multi-party democracy and India slipping to a single party uh, democracy. 2050. Okay, good question. Okay, that's good one. Uh, second, uh, Tibet, we know it's a kind of a red line for China. Uh, they already have a one country, two party system. Will they have a one country, three, pa three, uh, three party system? Uh, one country, two systems, you know, they have with uh, Hong Kong. So with Tibet, would they be open to a one country, three system kind of a way forward? Thank you. Uh, to answer your second question first, they don't need to. Uh, because in their uh, scheme of things, uh, Tibet is already been completely assimilated. Uh, the, the difference with Hong Kong and Taiwan is that they, are, they were until recently under uh, foreign control and Tibet is, uh, sorry, uh, Taiwan today is under a, a different system uh, and a different uh, sort of leadership. And therefore, to entice you into accepting uh, a unification with uh, China, uh, you need to give them at least a sense, like they did with Hong Kong, uh, that for several years you can continue to be what you are. We will not interfere with your look. Uh, that is only a instrument for, for uh, you know, uh, achieving a political aim. Uh, it is uh, not something that is that they believe in, uh, as you can see with what is happening in Hong Kong, you know, yeah. uh, the one country, two system, in a sense, is dead. So, dead, yeah. will they be able to convince people in Taiwan that uh, one country, two system can work? I don't think so. The first question, uh, you know, I'm not an astrologer, <laughs> so I cannot say what will happen. You can see that even within one year or two years, such momentous changes have been taking place. Uh, so what will happen, I do not know. But I will repeat what I said uh, to uh, Ram some time ago, that with regard to India's future, I do not see that future resembling Chinese, uh, Chinese present in, in a sense. Because I do not believe that the kind of diversity and plurality our country has, uh, it is amenable to that kind of a system. So democracy works in India precisely because it is the best means of, you know, allowing people of different faiths, of different cultures to actually live together and flourish together. And that is what, that is the way we should be thinking. So I, uh, I think I should answer your first question at some, at, at least try to. But I agree, on the second question, I agree with Sham. They betrayed Hong Kong with the, you know, with the promises they made to them. So what they'll have to do to get Taiwanese will be even more suspicious of, you know, uh, Chinese intentions. You know, I'm not an astrologer either, uh, though it would be profitable change the profession for both of us if we give up what we're doing. Uh, but I said this, that where I slightly disagree with Sham, uh, not very disagree, is that I think there is a concerted attempt at homogeneity. Uh, you know, it's, there is an attempt uh, uh, to make India a land of uh, one dominant, supremely dominant religion, one largely dominant language, uh, ways of life, you know, uh, 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 cuisine, all kinds of impositions, dress, all kinds of things are going on. Uh, so there's an attempt to flatten out the diversity at all levels, even, including within Hinduism. That's the first thing. The second thing, you know, we talk about one nation, uh, the Prime Minister talk about one nation, one election, one nation, one market. Uh, I have joked that at least when it comes to government, pro large government projects, we are one nation, one architect. Right. But actually, there's an insidious uh, attempt to make this not just one nation, one party, one religion, one language, but one NGO, which is the RSS. And this is serious. It's not been visible or noticed. It's uh, you have to understand the attacks on uh, other kinds of NGOs, on uh, the misuse of the FCRA regulations, and so on. In that sense, and actually, here is where China comes in, because there is a deep inferiority complex that the RSS has vis-à-vis -vis the Chinese Communist Party. And so does our ruling party. They would like to control and order and regulate social and cultural and political and individual life uh, in that uh, in the same way. So India, you know, if, if uh, 
for large amounts of Chinese, India is a teacher by negative example. For many in our ruling party, China is a teacher by positive example. Right. So I think it's, but the future is open. How the contest will take place? Maybe Shaham is right. We are too diverse and cacophonous a democracy uh, to be ruled, you know, with um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of homogeneous way. Uh, will China become a multi-party country? I mean, 20, 30 years, even 20, 15 years ago, Western writers were totally confident. And they had, you know, a kind of mechanical equation. When you grow economically, you become more liberal and you then... You, but I think the Chinese Communist Party has sold extraordinary longevity. I mean, I would, I would, uh, 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 I think both scenarios are very unlikely. Uh, I wouldn't say which is, um, uh, which is less unlikely, but certainly I would say this, you know, that there is, there are some, uh, there is a China envy among sections of the ruling elite in India today. You know, they would like us to be more orderly, more disciplined, more obedient. You know, uh, uh, more uniform in how we dress, how we conduct ourselves, how we prostrate ourselves before the great leader and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's really, you know, but I think the contest in both countries is, is open. Is it, is it, I think it's time for... Good evening. Uh, my name is Priyam Vada and I have perhaps another question about the future. Uh, considering that Sri Lanka has just probably gone into a state of bankruptcy, do you see China bailing them out? And do you think that we are possibly going to have Chinese neighbors in the South in the near future? <laughs> uh, one, I think uh, it is India currently, which is much more in the forefront of bailing out uh, Sri Lanka than uh, China is. Um, Chinese over the last several months have been extremely preoccupied. Uh, one, because of the um, you know, zero, zero COVID uh, policy, which is causing uh, huge economic disruptions uh, in China and also, you know, the supply chains. Uh, and also they are extremely preoccupied with the consequences of the Ukraine war uh, because they made uh, a bet by, by allying Russia, themselves yeah. much more closely with uh, Russia. And it is not clear how this is going. So there is a certain drawing back uh, in China. And uh, we uh, actually were quite uh, surprised that they reached out to India and said, can we work together uh, to bail out uh, you know, Sri Lanka? Now, why would they want to do that if they were in a position to bail out the Sri Lankans uh, themselves? What is today much more important for Sri Lanka is to get the IMF loan. And for getting the IMF loan, the critical country is the United States of America. And whether the Indians can persuade the Americans uh, to you know, go ahead and, and approve uh, that loan. Uh, so China currently is perhaps not the most important actor in terms of, you know, uh, bailing out Sri Lanka. And what is also happening around in our periphery is that there is a certain wariness uh, about the link economic links with uh, China, unfairly to some extent, because uh, Sri Lankan exposure to China is about 11% or so of its debt. So it's not that China is responsible for what Sri Lanka is facing. But in the public perception, in both Sri in Sri Lanka and as in well as outside, and the perception is that Chinese it is the Chinese who are responsible for having brought Sri Lanka to the point of bankruptcy. So suddenly you see a certain kind of wariness in Nepal, in Bangladesh, even in Pakistan, you hear voices okay. now saying that, you know, um, maybe we should be a little more careful uh, in terms of the uh, large credits or loans that we take uh, from uh, much of this is happening not because of what the Chinese have been doing, but because of economic mismanagement in these countries themselves. Uh, but that perception is certainly on the rise. I think, uh, before I come to the next question, I think maybe there's an element of what Paul Kennedy called imperial overstretch in, in, in the Chinese area. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean they, are, they are not really imperial in that sense at the moment. But uh, yes, I think uh, there, there is criticism within China itself that why are you doing this, uh, you know, when uh, foreign countries look at the problems that we are facing, you know. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. My name is Dipika. Um, 
Uh, my question is neither in history nor in future it's more to do with present i believe that in our lifetime uh, say next 40 years we may see an overturn of uh, global powers uh, probably from united states to china uh, about 5 years back i was on an exchange program in europe and what i learned was the educated europeans were starting to learn mandarin to become more useful in the future so my question to you is um, should what is more pragmatic according to you should we be now at this juncture looking within and going more into the uh, hey my older culture and civilization and am i bringing it out or uh, learn the mandarin language to be more useful <laughs> uh you should learn the mandarin language because i certainly feel that you know to understand china uh which is going to be a very important country it is already a very important country for you and is probably going to be an even more important country in the future uh knowing mandarin uh and having larger number of people who are familiar with china uh language uh skills are very important um i mean for me learning uh chinese was really the kind of passport to understanding uh, china uh, many people do chinese studies without knowing mandarin i'm so i'm not belittling uh, what they are able to achieve but i think knowing the language gives you that extra edge so i would be very much in favor of there being much more uh, you know mandarin uh, language uh, training in india than is currently uh, the case um, so um not necessarily to learn mandarin because you can do more business with china but because i think it is intrinsically important in itself the other aspect that you mention about uh, you know the uh, changes that are taking place uh, in power equations uh you know we 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 tend to uh, kind of uh, extrapolate what are current trends uh, into the future uh, and then we find that this is <laughs> actually not happening like uh, ram mentioned about the american belief that uh, free markets and democracy go together i mean that was the washington consensus for many years now you are saying saying something entirely entirely the opposite within the space of just uh, a few years uh, so i think it is it is impetuous in in a sense to make uh, you know uh, a kind of kind of uh, predictions uh, for the future even in terms of you know power equations what will happen is very difficult to say so you see what has happened with respect to ukraine you know nato had been written off nato is back with a bang for how long i don't know but they're certainly back with a bang right now many people had said um, russia will probably wrap up the ukraine war within 3 4 days not just the russians the americans and the europeans their considered opinion was that this will be wrapped up very quickly i think they were more surprised than even perhaps the russians were <laughs> at the ability of the ukrainians to be able to hold out so how things will work out there are imponderables which very difficult really to to uh, assess i think what we should be looking at what are some of the longer term trends what are the continuities which may be there still because of technology because of social factors because of certain enduring economic factors those are the things that we should be looking at because that would give you at least some sense of which direction we are headed in well this has been a wonderful discussion and learning experience for all of us and thank you sham thank My you pleasure. for being such a great audience the books are on sale outside it's uh, as i said it's a it's a book um, i began by saying indians need to know much more about china and this is the one book you need to read so thank you sham thank you bic